The last page has been turned on my most recent read. The ice is cracking in my homemade ice chai. Not as nice as one I could get from Starbucks, but there is definitely a lot less sugar in mine. Yes, I am still off the coffee. And I am ready to tell you all about the book I've just finished. So here I am, no spoilers, opinion filled and ready to roll. All of which means it's time for the latest episode of Being Bookish. I'm your host Ray, self-confessed bookworm, introvert, hermit, long-term depression sufferer and ex-coffee addict. Join me on my journey through my ever-growing to-be-read pile and enjoy the latest of my 100% spoiler-free book reviews. Another week has gone by and it was definitely an interesting one. I tested my social fortitude and went on a work night out. And because of my new meds, I seriously had to, unfortunately, limit any alcohol content and stuck to a single G&T. It was very prettily dressed up with juniper berries and small balls of ice before moving on to just pints of iced water which were refreshing, but nowhere near as exciting. Of course, that is always the way, right? I got home just before 11 and spent the rest of the evening placating a demanding cat who didn't like being left alone when it wasn't part of her usual routine. Anyone else have any animals like that? Seriously, it was insane. I didn't get to sleep until probably about half past one because every time I decided I was going to my bedroom, she would bite my ankles and cry. Anyway, this week I am actually reviewing something science fiction, albeit a little less on the traditional side, in my view. In fact, if someone asked me to define this book, I'd say it was actually a little difficult to classify, because this is more ex machina than Blade Runner. So light a few candles or perhaps just switch on that reading lamp because a bit of atmosphere is always a wonderful accompaniment to a reading session. Get yourself a fresh cup of something hot or a glass of something chilled, depending entirely on when you're listening and your preference, of course. And let's get started. It's been a while since I have picked up anything that could be classified as science fiction. I do have a few books on the still growing to be read bookcase in the corner of my lounge that I do plan on reading. And seriously, I need to start reading through my TBR because that bookcase looks as though it's going to tip over at any moment. I just keep on piling books on top of it because I can't fit any more on the lower shelves. And... They are books like the Wayfarers series by Becky Chambers, which has been sitting at the bottom of the pile for more than 10 months. And then there is a brand new addition to my collection, Ready Player One by Ernest Cline. Yes, I know it's quite old. I have been reassured it is much better than the film, which to me felt a little bit muddled and confusing. So it's not as though I'm short of books in the genre, but I find them much more difficult to review. At the same time, I don't feel that I am in the right position to critique it properly. I know that plenty of people love this particular genre, but it isn't right at the top of my list. I've already said that the book from this week is a little more difficult to classify. Is it science fiction? I'd say so. Would I say it's futuristic? Perhaps a little bit, but really I'd say that Clara and the Sun by Katsuo Ishiguro is more of a contemporary science fiction novel, a story set a little way in the future against a backdrop we are already incredibly familiar with. The Sun always has ways to reach us. From her place in the store, Clara, an artificial friend with outstanding observational qualities, watches carefully the behaviour of those who come in to browse and of those who pass in the street outside. She remains hopeful a customer will soon choose her, but when the possibility emerges that her circumstances may change forever, Clara is warned not to invest too much in the promises of humans. In Clara and the Sun, Katsuo Ishiguro looks at our rapidly changing modern world through the eyes of an unforgettable narrator to explore a fundamental question. What does it mean to love? 
have to be honest, as with many of the books I pick up on Impulse, I wasn't sure what to expect from this one. I bought it on my birthday, so around six months ago, when I was collecting my new glass prescription. I loved the simplicity of the red, blue and yellow cover, though obviously at the time I didn't see the connection to the story that it truly has. The book is told in six parts, all through the eyes of Clara, an artificial friend, or AF, who it's apparent from the very beginning is different from other AFs. The beginning of her story is told as she is in the AF store waiting to be chosen to be the companion for a lonely child. She watches the sun until it goes down behind a building across the street and observes the people who walk by and their lives. She sees a beggar man and his dog as they struggle on the streets until he dies, forgotten against a wall. She witnesses fights. She observes other AFs despised and treated abominably, and it's a memory that weighs on her and plagues her, terrified that this will be her fate, or the fate of the other AFs in the store with her, all waiting to get chosen. From the very beginning, the sun is important. Clara knows on some level that the sun is what fuels her, as her batteries are charged with solar energy. But as the story progresses, the sun and its power take an on an almost godlike quality. She believes the sun to be a saviour, a being to be worshipped, admired and thanked. The moment that has the biggest impact on her, that triggers awareness of emotion she is not completely familiar with, is when she sees the coffee cup lady and raincoat man. Clara is in the window when she witnesses a reunion. Coffee cup lady and raincoat man see each other across the street. Then the coffee cup lady reached the RPO building side and she and the man were holding each other so tightly they were like one large person and the son, noticing, was pouring his nourishment on them. Observing, Clara tells the shop manager that she finds their meeting strange because they seem so happy but also seem to be upset. Clara is noticing the nuances in their meeting and this is something that the manager finds fascinating. When Clara is still in the window, she meets Josie for the first time, a young girl aged around 13 and a half in Clara's eyes. The first thing that the observant AF notices is that Josie doesn't walk as steadily as most and that she favours one side more than the other. From the moment their eyes meet, there is a connection – and the promise that Josie will come back is something that Clara clings to, disappointing the store manager and possibly setting Clara on a path to the back of the store with the other AFs that she has been unable to sell. Time at this point feels incredibly unimportant in the story, especially as Clara is not really alive, so it could be weeks or months or even years, though it definitely isn't the latter. But finally, Josie returns, and though it takes some persuasion and a feeling that something else is going on, Clara finally finds her life companion in the young girl, and she has a home. Part two is where the cover of the book starts to make sense. Clara sees things as shapes. A person or a place fills boxes in her vision, perhaps pixels, perhaps screens that make up her eyes. For anyone who hasn't seen the cover I am referring to, I will put a picture of it on my Instagram at beingbookishpod. But to explain a little, the cover is red with a single square in the middle showing a beautiful, almost teal blue sky with just a tiny portion of the bright yellow sun in the top right hand corner. Josie, unfortunately, suffers with serious health issues and over time these become more so affecting her behaviour towards her friends, her family and her environment. It's obvious that she is both resentful and scared, understandably so. Trying to settle into this new environment, Clara occasionally struggles herself. She is met with resentment from Melania housekeeper and the mother, who both appear to have a problem with Clara being Josie's chosen companion, though for different reasons that do become clear as the story develops. Living with Josie, Clara gets to experience many things she had previously only witnessed through the window of a shop. 
As Josie promised her when they met for the first time, Clara gets to see what happens to the sun when it goes behind a building. Her amazement at the glow of different colours in the sky is described in a curious, clinical and emotional manner. The colour from the bedroom rear window was far larger than the gap of sky at the store and capable of surprising variations. Sometimes it was the colour of the lemons in the fruit bowl, then could turn to the grey of the slate chopping boards. When Josie wasn't well, it could turn the colour of her vomit, or her pale faeces, or even develop streaks of blood. At times it's easy to forget that Clara is in fact an artificial friend. The way she attempts to integrate herself almost seamlessly into Josie's life, providing her with emotional support when she is in need. And then the moments arrive when she is forced into a situation outside of the comfortable world she has created for herself within Josie's life, such as when she is almost bullied by children who call themselves friends of Josie. The scene during which teenage boys and girls refer to Clara as an it, a thing, is actually really uncomfortable, but I think they're meant to be. As the story continues and we witness Josie's health rapidly decline to the point where her mother is actually preparing for her daughter's death, it becomes clear that there is an ulterior motive behind Clara's presence in the house, one that feels foreign to me and also one that, if I reveal it, will spoil the only real plot in this book. While Clara is obsessed with being the best AF a girl can have, she is also battling with her own understanding of everything she is learning and witnessing. Whatever happens, everything she does is for the girl who took her away from the store, from an empty existence punctuated with brief moments in the sun, lapping up its life-giving rays. There are certain moments where Josie's mood, because of her life situation, changed so dramatically that she pushes away not only Clara, who is, in her mind, her best friend, but also her real best friend, a young boy called Rick, she grew up with, her mother and Melania, the housekeeper. She is understandably resentful of her lot in life. But then Clara discovers that this is a pattern Josie is familiar with and one that her mother is already dreading. And that is, she had an older sister called Sal, who unfortunately got very, very sick and passed away. You find this out indirectly through a photograph that Josie shows to Clara when she is telling her about life outside of the house that they live in. And a beautiful trip that they used to take when she was a child to a waterfall. Her sister Sal, unfortunately, is a girl that Josie doesn't remember very well. But her mother obviously does. And Clara is concerned for Josie's mental and physical well-being. So when these mood swings take hold, Clara is trying to placate the girl that she is, she loves as much as an AI is capable of loving. And she feels resentment towards the way that she is treated when she's pushed away because she is trying to help. Chrissy, who is Josie's mother, is far less accepting of Clara's presence in the house. But there is also that feeling that she is trying to adjust for her daughter's sake. She doesn't spend as much time at home because she is incredibly busy. She is divorced from her husband, Paul, who was made redundant from his job. And there are a lot of mentions of job shortages and the replacement of human workers by robots such as Clara, though obviously not companion bots, more technical robots. The, the irony being Josie's father, Paul, is someone who worked in the creation of these robots. So in a way, he is responsible for making himself redundant, though obviously you don't want to blame him for that. At one point around two thirds of the way through the book, we actually discover the true plot and it is rather dark. And one of my later book recommendations will make sense when you read Clara and the Sun. Rick... Josie's friend, 
is trying to get into the same university, same university or college as Josie, but he is not one of the lifted children. And this is a plot point that I had an issue with personally. There are a few mentions throughout the book of lifted children. And when Josie has her first gathering at which she introduces Clara to her friends, the parents of these other children are in the kitchen with Chrissy, Josie's mother. And they are talking about how it's so unfortunate that Rick wasn't given these advantages. And it's like, what is this lifted? And I and part of me wishes there was an explanation for it that made sense because it's thrown in there almost as a an afterthought. But then you do have to start to wonder whether it's they've been given some kind of drug that boosts their intelligence or a certain advantage because their parents have money within schools so they are a better edu- a better school. However, we do also find out that Rick, because of his mother's own mental health illness or mental health issues, isn't at school. He is too concerned about leaving her for extended lengths of time so he works from home and he doesn't get the same education as Josie. One of the things that I loved about Clara's observations of Rick and Josie was that she could see that they loved each other. And this is the bargain that she makes with the son because she is concerned about Josie's health. So when Josie's health is at its worst, she goes to pray to the son at a barn that she can see from Josie's bedroom. And she prays. And one of the things she's concerned about is, is the love between Rick and Josie true? Because she's almost bargaining with the son that this is the reason why Josie must survive. And she is emphatic. She is so desperate and the pleading is heartbreaking, especially as you realise that this is an artificial intelligence, a robot pleading for the life of a child that she cares for. As I've already mentioned, this book feels more like a contemporary science fiction novel with moments of a scientifically futuristic period interspersed with the life we are all familiar with. Pollution, money worries, job shortages. It could be based anywhere at almost any time, but these glimpses of a possible future are there for us to possibly hope for. Not sure if I'd want a robot companion. I think I've watched iRobot way too many times. Before I get into what I thought of the book, you know that I like to make sure that my review is balanced. So what did other reviewers think? Though I will say, having looked at the reviews first, the book is incredibly polarising. Emily May gave the book two stars and I got the impression she was disappointed with the story and its outcome. Clara and the Sun takes on the same old sci-fi themes authors have been exploring for decades and does nothing new with them, in my opinion. A girl called Josie and her mother purchase an AF, artificial friend called Clara, who then observes their interactions, plus the interactions between Josie and her friend Rick. Much time is spent looking at the sun, sketching and navel-gazing. I cannot figure out if we are actually supposed to be surprised by the info Ishiguro reveals halfway through or not, because it's obvious from the moment Clara is purchased. The story is deliberately vague, which here feels lazy rather than mysterious. Clara's stiff AI narrative voice makes for a dull read and it is even more disappointing to discover we are not being led anywhere remarkable. And I would like to say here that I actually have a very high tolerance for quiet character studies about human behaviour. Give me some Anne Tyler or Celeste Inga any day but I sadly did not find this to be a very successful one of those either. Clara, Josie, Rick and Josie's mother are not characters I will remember. This whole book lacked a spark for me. At the other end of the spectrum, we had Angie Kim who got an arc of the book before it was released in 2020 and she loved it, 
giving it a five star review. I tore through the arc in less than 24 hours and now I'm just sitting here with tears in my eyes, completely and utterly satisfied. I love Clara, the insightful and noble artificial friend, and I wish she were real so that I could hug her and tell her how much she means to me. This book is all my favourite things rolled up into one. Science fiction, mythology, suspense and mystery, and coming of age. Yes, of a robot. It's a beautiful and powerful exploration of important questions about humanity. What makes a person? What makes a life worth living and remembering? How do our beliefs and observations change the world? And vice versa. In many ways, I think Clara and the Sun is a companion piece of sorts to Never Let Me Go, probably my favourite Ishiguru novel until this one. Examining one world's solution to achieve the same type of improvement to society and human life that Never Let Me Go did. The goal is similar, but the means are almost opposite in the two books. Two sides of the same coin. I cannot wait for everyone to read this book because I need to discuss and debate it. So where do I fall when it comes to this book as it's the first I've read by this author? Here's where I get into the nitty gritty. Did I like it? It was beautifully written. There is no denying that. Ishiguru has a brilliantly beautiful way with words. He uses wonderfully descriptive text. His characters are very clearly defined. There is a clear separation between human and artificial friend. However, as has been said in one of the reviews, this is a coming of age story about a robot. She is learning and growing and developing all the time she is with Josie. And when the time comes for Josie to leave because she doesn't die, we get the poignancy of her coming to the realisation that her life is now over, which is really sad. We have the, there is a discussion between a Mr Capaldi who appears in the book around halfway through but is a key part of the bigger plot arc and Chrissy, Josie's mum, where they are discussing what is going to happen with this incredibly aware, very motivated, very determined, alive artificial friend. And Chrissy says that Clara has done her job and deserves the slow fade. And at the end of the book, you get that feeling of the slow fade with her memories. It's almost describing how I would imagine, I don't know personally, how I would imagine dementia to be with that memories fading their edges, blurring into one, the confusion and in a way, Clara's acceptance that this is happening to her. And that is really sad. But another thing that Clara had that none of the other AFs that we encountered in the book had was her belief system. The description of how a man-made creation in the artificial friend Clara develops a belief in something so strong her belief in the power of the sun and its healing properties because she knows that it helps her. And she has this absolute, unquestionable, unfathomable belief that it is going to save the young girl that she loves from dying. Will I read more by Katsuo Ishiguru? I have to be honest, I am not sure. The book left me with a warm feeling, but also a sense of something that was incomplete. This was less a story and more a series of observations, almost like a scientific experiment at moments. Today, the subject re realised they couldn't look directly into the sun. The fact that the central character wasn't human and would never be human was both confusing and unusual. Were it not for the fact that some of the characters in the novel made a point of highlighting that Clara was an it or a robot, then she, until she referred to someone by their role, such as mother or housekeeper, I actually found it easy to forget she wasn't human. 
I've heard such positive reviews of other works by him that I feel I should try Remains of the Day as it seems that the novel has a clear beginning, middle and end, which I honestly think this one didn't. It could have gone on forever without any purpose, which makes me sad because, as I have already said, the writing is beautiful. If you're looking for something like this or you loved this and want something else, then you might love these. I'm not sure where to start with this. My God, this sounds like every single point in this I've gone, uh, I don't know, maybe, not sure where to start. There were moments when I got a very Asimov vibe from the storytelling, not necessarily because of the writing style, but because of the way the characters were created. To me, Clara was very similar to Sunny from iRobot, or at least that's how I have felt about it. So I would say Isaac Asimov's short stories are a good place to start. Clara's connection with the sun and her search for the meaning of love also brought about thoughts of the mecha David from Super Toys Last All Summer Long by Brian Aldiss, which was adapted into AI, artificial intelligence. David's search for the blue fairy and his ability to feel love were incredibly similar to Clara's own search for meaning. Of course, if you want straight-up science fiction with AIs capable of faking it as humans, then you should definitely check out Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep by Philip K. Dick. Definitely a book that leaves you with a lot of questions. The summer is continuing. Yay! <laughs> which is great for people with SAD, not so great for people who burn, and I'm one of both of those, with beautiful sunny days and lovely warm evenings when I've been sitting out on the balcony with a cup of iced chai or a chilled rosé. Both are the perfect accompaniment to a good book, and I have definitely been reading quite a few of those of late. True, there have been some duds, but you can never tell without giving them a try. And I noticed that this is a question that has been asked across multiple forums in the last few weeks. How far do you read before you DNF a book or do not finish? And I'm one of those people, I very rarely do not finish a book, even if it's awful, because I think the author has taken the time and the plot might change. And I've got to the point before now where I have been maybe... 70 pages from the end of the book and thinking, why have I been reading this? It's awful. But I still continue on. I think I've probably DNF'd about three books in my entire life. And I feel guilty about every single one of them. However, somebody asked the question, how far do you read in a book before deciding if it's not for you? My answer is around 50 pages. However, when I reach that point in a book, I'm invested whether I like it or not, and I continue reading. So how far do you read in a book? Do you just read the first line? I was speaking with a friend this morning, and she said, my granddaughter only reads the first page of a book, and if it doesn't grab her, she will not finish it. And I admire someone who's got the fortitude to actually sit there and go, nope, don't like it, after one page. I also feel sorry for the author who spent ages crafting the rest of the story, but it's a personal, it is a really personal thing. So how far do you read in a book before you decide this is for you or it isn't? Do you carry on reading afterwards? Because I do. One thing that I have done in the last few weeks is finish my Goodreads challenge. I set the target at 50 books because I wasn't sure where I was going to be this year. You never know at the start of the year and anybody who has depression issues or social anxiety or any kind of anxiety will be able to tell you that sometimes you set a goal and you don't get there. And my whole thing with reading is I want it to make me feel good. So I set my Goodreads challenge at 50 books. I am now at 75, but I am not changing my Goodreads challenge because I can guarantee if I change it to 100 books, I will hit another reader's block and I won't get there. And then I will mentally beat myself up about failing at meeting the challenge that I set for myself. 
This month so far, I have read three books. One of them was admittedly only 150 pages long, but I have still read three books this week. And I am halfway through book four. Some of them I cannot talk about right now because they aren't released until the end of next month. The, actually, I think one of them is not released until the middle of January next year. So I'm embargoed on talking about them. But when they are available for review, they will be on my website and also on my Goodreads, which I will post on my website so you can link to it if you're interested. I did also manage to restrict my buying this week. Very, very proud of myself for that fact. Only way I managed to do it was by buying something else that I actually needed and then not going out at lunchtime on Tuesday when I was at work in the office. This Tuesday I'm going out, but I'm buying myself a new Xbox One. Well, not new Xbox One, a reconditioned Xbox One. But I'm still buying myself one. However, just because I haven't bought any books this week does not mean I am not looking for books to add to my ever-growing bookcase, which is falling over. So if you do have any fiction recommendations, see, I'm always going to be begging. Fiction recommendations, if you want to hear me talk about them or just think there's something I'd like to read, send me an email at notbeforecoffeepodcast at gmail.com or DM me on Twitter or Instagram and I will be sure to check them out. Just remember, send me UK Amazon links, not US ones. I can't buy US Kindle. It doesn't work over here, unfortunately. Over the weekend, I actually sent out my second newsletter for the podcast. It contains a few of the reviews that I've posted recently, a link to my current or my most recent episode, and also talk about the books that are released this week, of which there are only a few, and the books that I have been reading over the last couple of weeks. If you want to sign up for the newsletter or are interested to find out more, there is a form on my website and on my Twitter profile. Well, we're one week into August and the weather is holding up, which is rare for the UK. I am one week closer to my break and though I am not planning on actually going anywhere, apart from perhaps on a coach trip through the Cotswolds for a day to geek out as an Agatha Raisin fan, I am looking forward to all the books I am going to get a chance to read and hopefully I will make a bit of a dent in my TBR. I have to be honest, I am really disappointed to say that the releases this week are incredibly sparse. But as we get closer to September, which is always a busy publication month, things do pick up. So I will have some books to talk about next week. So now we get to the big thing. How are things in the bookish household this week? I really want some sleep. I am suffering severely from... Anxiety-related insomnia could be perimenopausal insomnia. The last few nights, I have managed to sleep by the skin of my teeth. It has been 2.30, 3.30. I think this morning, I went to sleep finally at just gone 4 a.m. and woke up three and a half hours later with a chronic headache because I hadn't slept long enough. And it is anxiety related. I'm lying down. I'm absolutely exhausted because I haven't slept well the night before. And horrific thoughts are going through my head. And I'm talking, I'm, going, I'm not going to wake up. If I go to sleep, I'm not going to wake up because I'm going to die. And my heart is pounding in my chest. My head feels really light, like my blood pressure's taken a hit. This morning, I actually went and took a blood sugar test at 15 minutes past four. So 4.15 a.m. this morning, I went into my kitchen and did a blood sugar test because that's how I, I felt that my blood sugars were really high. They are quite high, but they are my normal high. <laughs> we don't even need to go there. I have got an appointment with the doctor to discuss it. But poor sleep continues to plague me. And it doesn't, I don't think that even when I'm asleep, I'm getting to that point where 
I'm getting proper rest. Otherwise, I wouldn't wake up so tired the next morning. Unfortunately, when you wake up at 6.30, as anybody who works will tell you, when you have to get up the next morning, you force yourself to, and then you feel like pants the entire day. Of course, none of this this weekend was helped by the fact that I went out on Friday night with my work colleagues. I couldn't drink, but I did get to witness the managing director and the other directors of the company relatively unsteady on their feet, doing some very weird things, pretending to play golf and everything else. And you sit there thinking, I'm kind of glad I'm not drinking if this is what they're doing when they're drunk. But at the same time, it's also interesting to see how other people react in a social environment. I'm not very good in a social environment. I never have been. I always feel like I'd rather be sitting at the edge of it all in the peripherals observing. I'm more of a people watcher and I always have been. However, as somebody who is an introvert, it is exhausting. Whether you're with the people, you're on the periphery or you're in the thick of it, it is draining. As much as I'd like to say that when you're in a social environment, it is it gives you energy. If you're an extrovert, it definitely does. You are fueled by it. The more people you're around, the more interactions you have, the better you feel about yourself and the better you feel about the environment you're in. For me, I am still recovering from spending time with people two days later. I don't want to see anyone. I'm fine with speaking with people on the phone or on a video chat but I just want to be on my own. As I said, when I got home on Friday night, my cat wasn't very happy with me. Darcy is never happy if I go out in a way that is outside of the routine that she's accustomed to. And every time I tried to go to bed, she would stop me by crying and biting at my heels because she just wanted to snuggle with me for a few moments longer or just know that I was in the same room which was probably the case for most of Friday evening. Yesterday evening, she was exactly the same, even though I hadn't been anywhere all day. And it was almost as though she knew that I needed to not be anywhere else. I was invited to a 25th birthday party yesterday for my nephew. And I had to decline for two reasons. One, I had other things I needed to do, namely read Clara and the Sun. And two, Being around people after only just starting to re-energize myself after Friday would have knocked me for six for another few days. One advantage, however, to not sleeping as a reader is I got a lot of reading done. (laughs) So, So it's not all bad, but it's not great either. Well, that's it for this week and thank you for listening if you like what you hear why not share it with your friends and family and please post a star rating on good pods spotify or Podchaser. you can follow me on twitter at being underscore bookish where i'm pretty active and on instagram at being bookish pod or you can check out my website beingbookish.co.uk well i've got a lot to get ready for next week because i think the book i'm chosen is quite thick And it's calling to me. So until next time, this is me saying farewell.